Chris, one of the things that I've uh, been really passionate about in the last few years has been the need for Christians, American evangelicals in particular, to have more of a perspective uh, globally and a perspective about church history. And as, as someone I've done cross-cultural you know, missionary work in Europe and have come back to the United States and, and recognize that there's a lot of benefit from being in contact with Christians and believers in other parts of the world. Uh, you look at American evangelicals as an outsider looking in, and I'd just be curious, what would you say, looking to the global church, what would you say are some things that American evangelicals could learn and could take away? Yeah, I look, I mean, there, there are certainly things that, that I can say. I just, I just wonder whether the sort of evangelicalism that I come from is naturally quite close to American evangelicalism in a lot of ways, you know, so we, we, we often focus on the differences. But um, I think that the really incisive comment would probably come from people who come from neither of our Christian heritages. I, I got a friend who was doing some ministry in far north Queensland in Australia recently, working with Aboriginal communities there. Um, and the, the, the vibrancy of their faith I think has a huge amount to teach both of us. So he was preaching on a Sunday and he would get stopped in the street by people saying, can you please pray for me? And he said, yeah, yeah, of course I can. No, they said, no, now, I want you to stop right here in the street and I need your prayer now. And then they met in each other's houses in the evenings to discuss the sermon. They'd say, hey, preacher, come here. I've got something about your sermon from Sunday. And there was such an organic way in which the word of God and, and discipleship was just woven into the whole of life that really impressed him and really impressed me when he told me that story. So I think both of us would have huge amounts to learn from, from that sort of expression of Christianity. Um, me being a lot closer to US Christianity than that, um, I guess and there's always a danger in this, isn't there? Look, I'm, I'm sort of pointing one finger at US Christians and three are pointing back at me. So I'm, I'm not, you know, by any means well, and suggesting. You're, and, and you're not saying that there isn't a lot for oh, Christians no. in other parts of the world to learn from American Completely. evangelicals. We, we would definitely say it's a back and forth. Absolutely. And it, and it has to be, doesn't it? It has to be a back and forth. Um, but if, if you, you know, put my, my hand to the fire and say, tell us what you think is, is, is probably problematic about... Um, U.S. evangelicalism. I guess, I mean, and look, I'm not going to say anything that's, that's new and hasn't been said a lot before here, but that there is, and, and it did strike me coming over here, uh, an assumption that the individual is the basic unit of Christianity sometimes over here, um, and therefore uh, a, a failure fully to grasp and to rejoice in the, the biblical fullness of community and being the, the body of Christ and Christ's temple and the bride of Christ and so forth. Um, and I guess, and, and this is a problem that I think British evangelicalism shares as well, there's, there's a tendency to get pulled in by a certain managerialism. You know, what, what are the problems that need solving? What are the steps we need to solve them? And what resources right. do we need to bring to bear on them? Which is not, of course, wrong. You don't ever, you don't want to say we must never think in those terms, but I think there's a, a danger of that filling the horizon of Christians and, and losing, you know, the, the enjoying being with God, the spontaneity of, of fellowship with God sometimes. That, um, you know, running church such that if the Holy Spirit doesn't show up, nobody really notices and it's okay. You know, when it gets to that point, I guess, that, then there's, a, there's an issue with that. It all becomes procedural and, and whatnot. It's a danger, isn't it? For, for people like us, I, yeah. I think it's interesting that you mentioned the individualistic impulse, which is not only American evangelicals, that would be evangelicals in Australia, Great Britain, anywhere, really in the West. Um, that's something that really struck me as well when I was um, doing mission work in Eastern Europe. Um, we would have American evangelists come over and they would, you know, they would occasionally, they would do a, an evangelistic sermon and they would call people to, to faith in Christ. And they would sometimes say things like, um, I, I'm not calling you to to become a member of this church, or I'm not calling you into this church. I'm calling you just to you know give your heart to Jesus. And it was always fascinating to listen to the Romanian interpreters who would tweak that just a little bit in the way that they. And I remember in a conversation in, in class with some of my um, uh, Romanian colleagues and uh, Russian and Moldovan colleagues, and they and. We, they were asking why why this emphasis in the United States and then why this sort of tweaking or <laughs> the correcting of the theology of the, from the Romanians. And they would say, 
Well, because it's not exactly true that we say we're not inviting someone into the church. When we call someone to faith in Christ, we are calling them into the family of God. And so, it, yes, it's a call to an individual, and so there's something right about the individualistic impulse. But then at the same time, there's, there can be, and sometimes in the American context, a downplaying of the church as a community, as the family of God, in a way that is ultimately damaging spiritually. You know what would be really interesting? If, if in our translations of the Bible, every time it's a plural you in the original language, it was translated, I don't know, y'all or you guys or something like that. Just see how much of the Bible is corporate and how we sort of instinctively individualize it. So I was looking at that, that verse recently, you know, always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have. Yeah. And I, I was, you know, digging into the, the Greek and it's, it's all plural. And how easily we individualize that. And, and if it was always shoved in our faces, if all the plural yous were obvious plural yous, then I think we see, oh my goodness, like this is such a corporate vision. And we, yes. we just don't see that because our, our default mode is, is to individualize the Christian. Well, even when Paul says in Philippians to work out your salvation in fear and trembling, he says it's work out your together, y'all's salvation. <laughs> so they're working together. God is working through them as a body to work together their salvation, which is a, it's just a different way, I think, of thinking of the Christian life, which I just, I hope this conversation helps people realize how much we need each other. And it's brilliant, isn't it? Those, those passages in the Bible that make you think, oh, no, 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 what? no, no, it couldn't, it couldn't mean that, it couldn't be that. I'm thinking of, you know, when Cornelius gets converted mm -hmm. and he's baptized and so is his household. And we individualists think, oh, don't like that. Like, are they all believing? Have they all made the profession of faith? Yeah, but there's a sense that there's a corporateness there that I think the fact that we slightly bristle at it shows that there's something wrong with us, not something that wrong with the text. And if I can't see the goodness of that, then I need to work on my view of, of, of how the gospel relates to community and not simply to sort of isolated, atomized individuals. It's interesting. I mean, as a Baptist, I do ask the question about <laughs> believing, but, but I also, but I think there's something there about, there's something there about the way we come to faith. We come to faith as individuals, yes, but we also come to faith in, in groups together, like we, we belonging to, to, to one another. And so I think that's an important aspect of the, of the whole journey. And we don't think as isolated individuals as well. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I remember something that Tim Keller was very fond of saying, um, that, that he and Kathy over time would sort of grow so close together that they weren't quite sure whose thoughts were whose anymore. And I think that, yeah, that's very intense, isn't it, in a, in a lifelong marriage. But it's, it's also the case that we think corporately. You know, none of us are sort of think in a vacuum and we parachute to down from some, some heavenly pure sort of place and we, we form all our thoughts ourselves. We're borrowing thoughts from everywhere. And so if we over-individualize that, we're, we're not allowing ourselves to interrogate the extent to which, you know, is the way that I think my pure invention or am I actually osmosing ideas from the culture around me all the time?